everyone and a very warm welcome to another podcast of Clara in Conversation with me, Claire Ford. On today's podcast, I'm chatting with Jordan Young, versatile star of film, theatre and television and such brilliant Scottish comedy creations as PC Jack McLaren and Scott Squad, Danny and Legit, starring in the Scottish serial soap opera River City playing bad boy Alex Murdoch, as well as being in the highly acclaimed and hard-hitting theatre production Black Watch and being a mainstay at the wonderful Edinburgh King's Panto each year. Hello, Jordan, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, Claire. Thank you very, very much for having me. Thank you for such a, a lovely introduction. That was brilliant. You should be my agent. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Actually, Jordan, perhaps I should start by saying, hiya, pal, as you have just recently <laughs> completed <laughs> yeah, another successful stint as part of the Edinburgh King's Panto cast, where your character Muddles brilliantly bounces off of Alan Stewart, Grant Stott, Claire Gray, Sia Duda and Nicola Meehan. I travelled all the way from Greenock back in December to watch the Panto, which was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and you'll be pleased to hear that I wasn't disappointed. You said previously, Jordan, that you couldn't imagine a world without you working and starring in Panto. So what is it about Panto that makes it so special for you? Um, I've been doing Panto since I graduated from college, which was 2001. And uh, I've been in a Panto every Christmas, apart from the, the year of COVID that shut it down. So it's over now, it is over half my adult life. In fact, no, not my adult life, half my, my physical life um, I've been doing panto. So it's it's completely and utterly the norm for me. That is that is what I do at Christmas. Um, and I, I genuinely, and I say this a lot, like, you know, when, when people say, oh, they love their work and that, and it, it's just, it sounds, sometimes it just sounds pat and people just say that, but I, I love panto. I love going to my work. I love the buzz of it. I love the buzz of the theatre. I love the... The, the audiences, you know, it's a it's a genre that's it's purely designed to give fun and enjoyment and entertainment. And we're going on stage twice a day, and particularly the festival theatre, which is like a two thousand seater, if if that's full, which you know, it's four thousand people a day that you're trying to make laugh. And when it's going well, there is no better feeling. It's brilliant. It's an amazing feeling. I love it. Here, here. And as someone who's registered blind, I still enjoy going to the pantomime every year. I enjoy the jokes, the atmosphere, the music, the audience participation, but most importantly, the sheer camp value of it all. Every year, you also put on relaxed performances for panto goers who have additional support needs and complex disabilities. And these are always a great success. How important is it, Jordan, to make panto accessible for all? Well, I mean, hugely important. I think that um, that goes across society for everything. I think, you know, any form of art or entertainment should be accessible to everybody. And, of course, there are, there are challenges on, on, on many mediums of things that can't be accessible, but I think we, as uh, in the arts, have to try our, our utmost to make it accessible to everybody. And I think the, the relaxed performances, which are now certainly in all Crossroads panels, across the country. Um, uh, I don't know about the other, the other companies, but I'm sure they do do them. You know, it's been going for, uh, I'm plucking a figure out of the sky here, but maybe nine years, something like that. And see the feedback we, we get from, from families and people who, particularly people who have got maybe severe learning difficulties or, or, or severe uh, additional support needs that they can't, their families can't take them to the, the theatre um, on a an average performance because they're worried that their behaviour will disrupt the rest of the audience or disrupt the, the cast and that. So it's been completely off limits for them, which is obviously horrendous. That's awful because everybody deserves a chance to have a lovely time at Christmas and see, see a panto. And, you know, it's one of our our favourite shows because it's it's just it's a lovely lovely atmosphere. Um, you know, I, I I'm someone who I, I I don't I don't have disability, so I, I can't comment for people who do. But I I can imagine that it, I'd be incredibly frustrated and possibly upset that 
if I couldn't attend things, if or I couldn't take part in, in mainstream things because of that, I, you know, I, it'd be pretty, pretty frustrating to imagine. So I think we as a society, and a much broader than just panto or, or theatre, I think we should all be pushing towards making everybody in, included. Absolutely. I think it's an incredible thing that theatres are now starting to incorporate that into their repertoire. And you spent 12 wonderful years, Jordan, working in Panto at His Majesty's Theatre in Aberdeen before making the move to the Edinburgh King's Panto back in 2019, starring mm-hmm. alongside such favourites as Elaine C. Smith, Alan McHugh, Stephen Dennis and even Jimmy Osmond. How was the decision made for you to move to the Edinburgh King's Panto? And how big a wrench was it for you to leave His Majesty's Theatre? Um. The decision was made by the the bosses, the head honchos. I, I've got two young kids, and when you're in Aberdeen doing panto, you can't commute, so you you stay up there. It's you know it's too far to drive, two and a half hours each way. So I, I wasn't seeing my kids over Christmas, uh, apart from my day off. So I'd, I'd drive down on a Sunday night. I'd be off on a Monday, then I'd drive back up uh, Tuesday morning. So that was really difficult. So, you know, I'd made my feelings known to the bosses that I would like to be more central and that there is only Glasgow and Edinburgh are the the two um, crossroads uh, pantos that go on. And we'd go and see, uh, me and Al McHugh, we'd go and see Edinburgh every year because it always ran later than Aberdeen. So when we finished, we, we could go and see the run. And I was completely and utterly in love with Edinburgh show. I was completely and utterly in love with uh, Alan, Grant and Andy and what they did in in the show. Um, And it was something that I, and I I was relatively vocal about it, that I'd like to do Edinburgh one day. Um, You've got to be careful as well. I had an amazing time in Aberdeen and I've got nothing but fond memories and it was great for me. It was a wonderful, wonderful period of my life so it was never about oh, I want to get away from Aberdeen but after 12 years I think probably the audiences were <laughs> glad to get rid of me as well you know <laughs> uh, a, a change is as good as a rest and I think I think uh, it's probably suited all parties but it's strange leaving where uh, a theatre that you've been for 12 years that you know the crew really well the crew are your pals the front of house are your pals. The the theatre staff, you you know them all. You know you know everywhere where to go. You know you, the audience know you, and I think it's it's a, it's quite difficult when you an audience know you for that long, and you've got a, a real repertoire with them, and it's enjoyable, and they know what to expect, and they've got a familiarity. And then you go to Edinburgh, and they're like, right, we don't know you. We have no idea what you do, and they're of course they're judgmental. Of course, and that's not an Edinburgh audience; that's any audience in the country. It'd be the same with Aberdeen when you first start. Like, mm-hmm, and what? Well, okay, new boy, what? What is it you can do? So I was fully aware that the audience were never going to be immediately. Oh, we like him. You know, it's it's going to be a slow build because they've got their team. They've got the the three. Well, actually, Claire as well was there before me as well. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it wasn't, it was a di- more difficult transition in my head because I put a lot of pressure on, on, on myself of, I, I, I need to make this work for the audience and I, I need to find my way in there. But the staff at the theatre and obviously the cast couldn't have made it easier for me. They couldn't have been more welcoming, more just on board with it, you know, which... They could easily be like, all right, here's the new guy. What has he got? But everybody is so supportive. The, you know, Alan and Grant are just brilliant. Going right, we'll get. They're very generous in their uh, what the the material they'll give you. They're always going right. Do this. There's a joke for you. You know, it's not. It's never about. Well, I want the best joke. They're they're very much like. Oh, I've thought of something that you could do that's brilliant. You know, and that's it's fantastic. And having that support from people who I can genuinely say hand on heart. I am in awe of and admire so much and have watched for years and think they're at uh, the top of their game to then be able to be on stage with them and 
have a, have their respect and and trust. I think trust more than respect is is, is just it's it's phenomenal. So it's been amazing. I'm so genuinely lucky and happy and excited about what the future holds about being in Edinburgh. Well, 2022 was the first time I went through to watch the Edinburgh Kings Cantle. I've heard so many people saying over the years how amazing it is and you can definitely tell the camaraderie and the closeness just with everybody and it is you can definitely tell there is it's a family atmosphere and it was it was just a pleasure to be in the audience watching just seeing the chemistry between you all on stage oh brilliant yes in panto jordan you play the characters of muddles buttons and wishy-washy the cheeky chappies and you play these characters with such consummate ease some of the characters that you play on television also have a bit of the cheeky chappy about them too most notably <laughs> pc jack mclaren danny and kevin from still game are a bit wide but are full are full of a fair sprinkling of patter how much of yourself do you put into playing these types of characters I think it's, it's difficult because I, I think I don't know if I'm a, a cheeky chap. Is um, you know everybody who says that I, I think I've got a good sense of humour. I think you know I, I love a laugh. I love a carry on. I love um, mucking about. I love um, making people laugh. So certainly in panto, that's you know it's a much much heightened version of myself. So I, that medium is just me having fun, and I love I love making people laugh or trying to make people laugh. Uh, I do love comedy. Um, I think it, you know people like maybe Danny at Legit or, or or Kevin at Still Game, and that they are quite wide boys, uh, quite maybe streetwise and whatnot. I, I I don't think I'd ever describe myself as streetwise or. I don't think I'm a, a white boy. I, you know, I'm sure anybody that knows me well would probably never describe me as white. Um, probably, I, I think cheeky chappy, maybe uh, up for a laugh. Um, but yeah, I don't. I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> streetwise. <laughs> <laughs> and when, what was your take on your panto co-star and close friend Grant Stott's parody? That's Fife being a proud Fifer yourself. Did he get a dig in the ribs from you, or were you just a bit miffed that neither King's Kettle nor Kennaway get a mention? Well, uh, anything that uh, celebrates Fife is to be applauded um, uh, in my book. Uh, and I think it's brilliant. I think it's absolutely great. Um, you know, because you, 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 I, I don't know if this is fair to say, you don't hear a lot about Fife. Fife doesn't get a lot of stuff like that. Um, not a great, a, a massive pat in the back. Uh, you know, Kennyway or Kettle was not mentioned, which uh, is disappointing. But <laughs> no Grant, no Grant, there'll be a, there'll be a second version, uh, and often, I'm sure he'll, wait, he'll write a new one. I can see if I can get those two mentioned in it. <laughs> mm, definitely, definitely. Grant is um, a real genius when it comes to stuff like that, um, and he, you, you know, under the radar genius because he he does all that himself. He, he He's brilliant with lyrics. He always writes his own song for the for the panto. Um, he's, he's he's really good with words. He's really good at you know if we're in the rehearsal room and we're talking about gags or that. He he comes up with a lot a lot of gags, uh, wordy stuff. He's really good with stuff like that. But don't tell him I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you appreciate that absolutely. <laughs> now you're not the only famous person to hail from King's Kettle. The singing kettle is named after the village, which is home to Artie and Scylla, who entertained children for decades and provided many small children with their first experiences of live theatre before moving on to watching pantomimes. Actually, Jordan, my cousin Rory Ford stars alongside Ryan Moyer in the McDougals, which is in the same tradition as the singing kettle, and along with Funbox, continue the great work that Artie, Scylla, Gary, Jane, and latterly Kevin and Anya pioneered. Now tell us the truth, Jordan. Do you think PCs Fletcher and McLaren would let Artie and Scylla off with going through a red light like PCs singing McCurdy did? I think um, PC Fletcher definitely would. I think uh, yeah. she's, a, she's a soft touch and she, she definitely would. Um, absolutely no way with Jack McLaren. No, no way. <laughs> Absolutely not. I think 
he, he, Jack McLaren is not impressed by celebrity. He's only impressed by good-looking people. <laughs> 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 Hasten to add, that's Jack McLaren, not Jordan Young. Disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beauty of being an actor is you can pretend to be someone that you Absolutely. That, that's, that's, that, that genuinely is the, the, the best part of it. You can do the worst things ever. You can do everything and it's not you. It's just pretend. It's brilliant. Absolutely. Absolutely. And going back to your childhood and teenage years, Jordan, was a career in acting or comedy always something that you wanted to pursue? Um. When I was uh, much younger, as in primary school age, I've got a distinct memory of really enjoying making people laugh and really enjoying making adults laugh. Um, I remember like, if my mum and dad had friends over or even teachers or, or, or adults, I, I loved sort of the feeling of it always made me feel like, oh, I, I'm on their level if I, if I can make an adult laugh, you know. Um, but I suppose that was the performer in me, the entertainer in me. But it wasn't till high school that I really had any idea that I was going to be an actor at all. Um, I, I lost my dad when I was 14 and I kind of threw myself into drama uh, as a sort of just a distraction or or a therapy, if you like. Uh, my drama teacher was was amazing with me. So I did plays. I, I used to skive off other subjects and then go and sit in the drama department. And she was brilliant. April Simpson, my teacher, she was absolutely brilliant for that. She took me under the wing and it was her that she one day, she just said, um, you're going to go to drama college because we're, we're getting at the age where we're talking about careers and I didn't have a clue. I was not academic at all, at all. And I think, you know, was, a lot of that was probably due to losing my dad. I just didn't have any focus or, or, or stuff. Um, but my one day we're talking and um, the drama teacher, she said, oh, you're going to go to drama school. And I was like, what? I had no idea. You know, nobody in my family had went to college or uni or anything like that. And particularly even now, when you say you're an actor, people struggle to really understand what that entails. I mean, they understand what the job is, but the practicalities of how do you become an actor and how do you get work and how do you find work and, and how do you audition, all these kind of things. It's, it's, it's a kind of, it's quite a strange profession. But um, I, I auditioned for, uh, I went to audition for Dundee College and I got in there for a year for an NC, um, an HNC, sorry, and that was the best thing I did because that that was quite an intense year of basically saying before you go to drama school, you need to decide if you want to do it because it's kind of, it's really intense. Um, so I did that year and I, I got into Queen Margaret in, in Edinburgh and did my degree there and absolutely loved it. I loved the Dundee and, and Edinburgh. Loved both those courses. And many people here in Scotland, Jordan, will know about your career through starring in some of our best-loved Scottish comedies, as well as being in River City and in Panto, which most people will have seen you in at some point. You have also starred in some very brutal and hard-hitting productions over the years. River City's Alex Murdoch is a real nasty piece of work, but the gritty realism of the film adaptation of Urban Welsh's film as well as the National Theatre of Scotland's production, Black Watch, is at times unrestrained. How do you approach playing such very dark and intense characters, Jordan? I think it's what uh, we, we touched on earlier, of the beauty of being an actor is you get to explore everything and anything with no consequence. You you get to play and, and be be things that you, you you can be horrible but you're not really being horrible you're getting to exercise that that kind of you can be any sort of emotion or any kind of characteristic but there is no comeback on you you know you, you do you're horrible in real life there's a there's a there's a penalty to that you know you you, you fall out with people with people you, know, you get the jail um it's just playing it's i think you, you approach it like i think this is quite cliched, but it's very, very true. If you're playing somebody that's a nasty piece of work, you can't judge the character. 
you can't think they're a nasty piece of work. You have to play them doing what they're doing because everyone, you know, the the horrible people in society tend not to believe they're horrible. Mm-hmm. They they can justify their own their own behaviours and actions. So they they can go, oh, I did that because of that. You're like, yeah, but you you just hurt two hundred people. You're like, yeah, but I, I did that because of that. And I think that's what you've got as an actor. You, you shouldn't really ever cast judgment on your character because you you're, you're you're trying to find the justification that that person has for for their, their behaviour. So I think that'd be my main thing is never cast judgment on a character's uh, behaviours. Think absolutely, and sometimes the people who play these characters are the best actors because they are, they are able to escape from real life and be whoever the, the, the writers want them to be with the characters. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, it's like characters that where if they are a, a real, real nasty piece of work or scary or whatever, and then you you see them in another production, be it TV or theatre, or you see them in the street and you still judge them on them being that horrible person. I think that's because they did a brilliant job at it. Absolutely. You know, like you can, and you see there's lots of really famous, you know, um, you know Ben Kingsley in uh, Sexy Beast, where I think he gives one of these m- most, the, the most sort of amazing film performance, mm-hmm. utterly terrifying. And I reckon mm-hmm. if I went for a drink with Ben Kingsley, I would judge him on that character, and and that's you know because he was so good and so terrifying in it. And I have to admit, Jordan, I am a massive fan of Legit. I remember wow. watching the pilot episode back in 2006 with my parents who fobbed me off about what a threesome was. And by the time we go into the bit, <laughs> where Danny... Apologies, apologies. <laughs> by the time we got to the bit where Danny and Sammy are pulling and hauling at the underpants of Andy Gray's kinky zookeeper, I was asked to run an errand that would remove me from the television screen for the remainder of the programme. I subsequently went back and watched all six episodes of Legit on BBC iPlayer, and I absolutely love it. But how disappointed were you that a show that did so well with the viewing figures was popular with Scottish audiences and written by the legends that are Ian Connell and Robert Florence wasn't renewed after the initial first series? Uh, I'll be honest, I was absolutely devastated. I was devastated. I was, you know, I was 27. I think I was 27. And it was my first big telly job. And naively, no, it's a total learning curve, but naively at that time I thought, oh, this is it. This is the start of, uh, this will take off. You know, you think, oh, this will have eight series and it'll do this, it'll do this, it'll do this. And then, then it didn't. And it was a real disappointment because I think, we, you know, I, I look back at it now and it's, it's, it's dated. It's really dated, of course, because comedy's changed a lot and it's, you know, I'm, I'm, a lot of people could pick holes in it and, you know, uh, it, it was far from perfect. But I, I think it had something about it. It did. We had a lot of good guest stars in it. I think it was, uh, I think it was funny. I think it, it, it definitely deserved a second series, but I never got one. Um, unfortunately, we were in competition with another show that uh, was chosen I think there was only budget to make one of these shows, so they went with the other one, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, a, a real learning curve for me on expectation and realizing that you know, don't count your chickens. Because I really thought I was, oh, this is gonna, it's gonna make my name. It's gonna be a real. This is a start of something big, and then you get one series, and you're like, all oh, right, that's it. <laughs> back back to pulling pints in a pub. But I suppose it's a lesson as well in bouncing back to having to pick yourself up and just keep going. But it's just, it's been so good to go back and watch it again because I was only 10 when the series came out and um, watching it as a 27-year-old compared to as a 10-year-old, you know, you get a lot of things that you maybe didn't get when you're when you're a lot younger. So it's just been a privilege. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank you. I it's, it's, I had a great time filming it. It was a lovely, lovely bunch of people, a great crew, great cast. Um, Steve McNichol, who, who played Sammy, I did my first couple of jobs with him in theatre in Edinburgh. Um, so I knew him really well. He was a good pal. 
So it was, it was it was great. It was great. You know, it's quite depressing to look at it now and and, and realise how much I've aged. But you know, that's that aside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you met your lovely wife Karen Jordan back in two thousand and five when the two of you were working together at the Glasgow Kings Panto. But it wouldn't be until a year later that you landed the role of Danny. But did you try any Danny S. Patter on Karen to win her heart? Oh no! I you see that's where me and my, my Jordan very very is very different from you know I I've kind of Danny was very much I was was Danny a ladies' man or was he trying to be? A ladies' man, same as Jack McLaren. I want to be a ladies' man, and I suppose Alex Murdoch is a bit of a, a ladies' man. But I was utterly rubbish at chanting people up. I was really, <laughs> really rubbish. Um, I, I was, I was fine if I didn't fancy somebody. I could be confident and chat and go you know, the banter and that. See, the second I, I fancied somebody, I would turn into this really socially awkward, weird stuttery, stumbly, odd person. Um, uh, I hated it. And, I'd, you know, I, I, the, the way I told my uh, car and I kind of fancied her was through telling her pals, you know, like I was seven-year-old. I was like, you know, I thought that, that's the best way because then she's got a gauge, then the kind of, the onus is on her a wee bit to, you know, because I was never brave enough. I was terrible with women. Terrible. Really bad. Sadly. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked out in the end, obviously. Well, it worked out. No, no, I don't I don't need to be good with women because I'm very happily married and you know, as long as as long as she stays with me, I have I've not got an issue. <laughs> <laughs> and as we also mentioned earlier on, Jordan, back in two thousand and six, you were awarded the part of Roscoe in the original production of Gregory Burke's powerful no holds barred play Black Watch, which gives a voice to the soldiers fighting as part of the regiment in Operation Telic in Iraq. Many of the Black Watch regiment's recruits come from Teesside, Perthshire, and Fife. As a Fifer yourself, how did the nightmare experiences of some of the characters resonate with you on a personal level? Um, that, I mean, that was one of the the most important jobs of, of my life. Um, it was definitely one of the most exciting jobs I've, I've ever been involved in. Um, quite a, a, I don't know if it's career defining, but a very, very special experience. It was a really special experience. Um, my granddad was in the Black Watch and I I was really, really keen to be in that show. I, I did a, a radio play, one of Greg Burke's radio plays, about maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, year before Black Watch, and I remember speaking to him. It's the first time I'd ever met him, and I was at, at the studio, and he said, "Oh, National Theatre Scotland have commissioned me to do this play about Black Watch," and of course, immediately I perked up because I'd been five and my granddad, and I was like, all right, uh, and about maybe I don't know eight nine months later. They asked me to go along and do the workshop. So they often maybe do workshops for a, a couple of days on plays just to see how it's going, just to get actors in the room to hear things and try ideas and stuff. And there was a, maybe 10 of us went along to that. And I really, after those couple of days, I was like, oh, I really would want to be in this play. And I'd been offered another job. It was a remount of a show I'd already done. It was, I think it was going to Canada. And it clashed, but I'd already signed the contract. And uh, I think, was it John Tiffany who directed it? I'd said to him, look, I really want to do this. And he, he said, well, you'll need to get out the other job. And <laughs> my agent at the time, who I'm no longer with, was like, well, I can't get involved. You've signed the contract. If you want out that job, you have to get out yourself. So I got in touch with the company and I said, look, I think I'm going to get offered this. Black watch this new play and I really really want to do it and the director who she's a pal and she was brilliant and she, but she was like Jordan I can't I've cast you and it's too late in the day you're going to have to go to Canada with us I'm really sorry so I had a couple of days of being utterly devastated that this wasn't going to happen and which is very 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 unlike me but I got quite assertive and was like nah I'm not doing that play I'm just going to pull out. 
And but I didn't do it in a, a kind of arsy way. I did it in a way of going like, I'll do everything I can can't help you. I'll pay for you audition people. I'll pay for your audition room. I was I was just going to go. I'll do whatever I can. I'll, I'll and I gave her a list of maybe fifteen actors who I thought would be great in the role and stuff. And she eventually, I think, she saw how much it meant to me. And she's like, right, we'll release you because I mean, ninety nine point nine percent of the time they would never take legal action companies because it's too it's too small. But you have signed a contract. You you should really be seeing it through. Anyway, that was kind of a long-winded way of saying that. that and then I, I eventually did Black Watch, and it was pretty special. It was really special, yeah. And I remember watching the news coverage of it at the time. It was pretty groundbreaking. It was, um, I think, it, we, it, because it was uh, a story about real people, about real people who had lost their lives, and also the conflict was still going on when the show was going out. So there was a lot of anger towards the government about being underfunded and it, these these soldiers were mistreated or lied to a lot and didn't have the right equipment and they were their um, tours were getting extended when they were told they'd be home by Christmas and they weren't and then people were dying and then when people were dying or when you're telling stories of people that died and they were from Glenrothes, you know, it's like five miles long the road from where I grew up. It's quite important that you try and tell this story properly. And when we, you know, it, the, the show did explode all over the Edinburgh Festival. It was like the hit. It was huge. And the buzz, I, I probably never experienced anything like that in my career again, was incredible. And when we took it to the States, how it resonated there because... They, you know, they've got soldiers out there as well. They had Marines out there, and it's a very, very emotional piece of theatre. Uh, it was, it was very special. As someone with a sensory impairment, Jordan, I was particularly touched with the use of BSL sign language in Black Watch. And although I couldn't see the emotion for myself, I felt as if it was palpable in the scenes where sign language was used. You must take great pride, Jordan, that you starred in a show that was both groundbreaking and at the same time critically acclaimed. Oh, I, absolutely. I, I think, like saying earlier, that it, I, I probably won't ever experience such a, a high on stage as that uh, ever again in my career. It was the, um, Peter Forbes and Paul Higgins were the kind of two elder uh, actors in the, in, in the show. And I say elder, they were both under 50 at that, at that stage. But we were all kind of early to mid-20s. And, you know, it was, I say, it was an explosion on the Edinburgh Festival. It just went huge. And I remember those two saying, boys, soak up every second of this job because this doesn't happen very often. And they were both really experienced actors. And they're like, that. that this comes along once in a lifetime, a show like that. So... Uh, Pride, absolutely. Um, a lot of guys, because I had a, a few different casts after the original, uh, after a lot of us left, you know, the, the show continued and went went around the world with, with a lot of different boys and it's uh, continued, uh, it, it, sorry, it created a lot of really big careers. Aye. And as we mentioned earlier on, Jordan, you very tragically lost your dad at only 44 years old, just a little older than what you are right now. In your earlier yeah. days of starring in River City as Alex McAllister, now Alex Murdoch, he and his ex-wife Kelly Marie were at the centre of a storyline involving the death of their prematurely born baby boy. Your acting was brilliant and very convincing and even had the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, calling for you to win an accolade due to your performance in the role. Does going through such pain and trauma at such a young age allow you to draw from that well? Or as an actor, do you follow a process that does not require you to draw from personal experiences? Um, very, very good question. I think um, I think it's when you've went through something as uh, life-changing and traumatic as that, it does open you up to where, uh, to emotionally where you, you can go and how how dark and horrible um, life can be and feel sometimes. Um, 
you always got to be careful because when you, you say things like that, it, it's not excluding uh, actors who can create better emotions than I can through, and they've never been through trauma. So it, it certainly doesn't, it doesn't, I would never say it gives me the the upper hand or it gives me the uh, a better chance at creating that. But I can speak from personal experience. It certainly helps me and and, and stuff like that, having gone through um, trauma in my life. Um, I think you've got to be careful. Or, and I learned this at drama college. I was doing a play uh, where my wife died and at the very end. And the last scene was me walking on stage to her graveside and laying flowers and breaking down, um, like to be very emotional. And in rehearsals, I, I remember doing it, and uh, and uh, the director, she was like, you, "You're just not. I need to see you breaking down. I need to see you. Yeah, this man's broken. He's lost his wife." Because I was obviously holding back, not not intentionally, just that that was the way I, I, I was performing it. I, I, I wasn't given what was required. And uh, I tapped into sort of a lot of stuff. I hadn't that long lost my granddad at that stage. Um, and I've been in the rehearsal room because I had him about five five minutes off before that scene. And I remember being in the rehearsal room and just kind of taking myself to the side and then just tapping into the the sad stuff at the time. And it opened up floodgates. And I, I, I couldn't really stop after, you know, wait, I... I mean, it looked great for the rehearsals, and they were like, "Oh, yeah, that's that's exactly what I need. That's brilliant." But it wasn't brilliant for me because I couldn't stop it. I couldn't tap out of it. I'd I'd opened up uh, an emotional, personal thing, and I just kind of lost myself emotionally. So that that was a a learning curve for me. Then, if you're going to tap into something, you can't leave yourself vulnerable to that, and just opening up your own uh, personal wounds. You've got to be able to, you know. At the end of the day, is acting what we're doing. We're pretending. Mm. If you can recreate, if you can remember the feeling of something, but not go down the dark place of taking you there. It's always been something that I've been fascinated with to see the processes behind that. It's it's a fine balance between yeah reality and acting, really. So it's a, a fascinating process, and. You play the character of PC Jack McLaren in Scott Squad, Jordan, the hilarious mockumentary about the fictional Scottish police force. Now, Jordan, PC McLaren isn't the only police officer that you've played. You played a police officer in the very popular Scottish drama Rebus, as well as in the film Pervis and Picala. Given your pong strong for donning the uniform, did you ever consider a career working with Scotland's finest? I did, yes, I did. Um, I I have played quite a, a few police actually. Um, I don't know, I don't know why that's happened. I think it's it's purely coincidental as opposed to I look like one. Um, <laughs> I uh, I when you know talking earlier about when my my drama teacher said you'll uh, you're going to drama college. When I had my careers meeting with the I think it was either the assistant head or whoever he was uh, at the time. I put on the, you had to put fill in the form and I put actor as number one and policeman as number two and I can't remember third was maybe a salesman or something and I, I walked in the room and he had my, my sheet in front of him and before I crossed the room to sit down at the desk with him, he'd scored off actor. Um, as I was walking across the room, he said, you know, well, 90% of actors are unemployed and he scored it off without having any chat about it without any sort of you know maybe you could do it and I remember it, and then he started he, he gave me pamphlets about the police and he started talking about the police and he talked about your oh, good career and pensions and this blah 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 but that really I'm quite uh, I can be quite stubborn and pig headed if I put my mind to stuff like and I remember thinking well there's another way to look at that there's, there's 10% of actors employed why can't I be the 10% and that, and I, I just, it's always stuck with me going how he, he tried to just, that's it. No, you're not going to be an actor. But yeah, that was, it was I, I, so police was second on my, uh, <laughs> my career's letter. But arguably one of the finest comedies to come out of Scotland in recent years, Jordan, is Scott Squad. 
which follows police officers of every kind, from the chief commissioner to the CID, to Bobby's on the beat, to traffic cops, to community volunteers, to desk officers, to computer analysts. You play the character of PC Jack McLaren, the smooth talker, the Adonis, <laughs> the tennis club of Mario, <laughs> and you get to play the character alongside your real-life close friend, Sally Reid, who plays your partner on the show, PC Sarah Fletcher. Scott Squad has just recently finished production after eight series. How much are you going to miss being a part of the cast? And most importantly, how are you yourself and how are we, the viewers, going to cope without it? Um, I'm going to miss it massively. It's It's been utterly joyous creating that character and going on the journey with it. Uh, going into work, and I can't call it work, I mean, that's the term that you would use for it, but going in every day when I, we were shooting it, to work with Sally, the director, Noddy, the the crew, it was it was like mucking about with your pals. It was absolutely brilliant. It, it was just joy. It was sheer joy. I I I loved every second of that job. It wasn't a huge time commitment through the year. So for a series, so for six eps in a series, I would probably be filming tops maximum maybe five days so you're maybe and sometimes it's three days so you're between three and five days once a year so it won't impact me in terms of oh I've got three months that I need to fill or that but it, it's no it's no longer there it's, it's a show that, that, won't, that won't be continuing but I think it's probably the right time for it I, I've been quite in agreement with with ending it when they have um because you could easily just keep commissioning things and keep it going, keep it going. But eight series of any comedy is is probably enough. Particularly, it's it is kind of sketch show. You know, they're standalone sketches. They're not um, narrative based, where you're you're moving the story on. Our characters aren't really moving on. Uh, I mean, they are, but in a, in a more sketch form. So I think it, it it's it's done what it's out to do, and I think it, it did it well. But I think it's time to open up and invest in new shows and new people, and new talent, and and I, I say that honestly, you know, I could easily sit here and go, like, "Oh, I wish it was going again." But I think it probably is time. But I I loved every second of playing the 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 rubbish uh, <laughs> the rubbish policeman Jack McLaren. <laughs> it's fantastic to hear that, and we loved seeing you playing Jack McLaren as well. And again, like the panto, you could just tell there was such a close camaraderie with the cast. When oh, I great. Think that's Thank what you. Makes it even special. Thank you. And I believe, Jordan, that a lot of the scripts in Scott Squad, indeed a lot of the lines, were ad-libbed. I would love to think that the lines, am I a shagger? Yes, I am. Will you call me PC McLaren? Yes, you will. Were ad-libbed. But exactly how much direction were you given before going on set to film scenes? I, I'm trying to think if uh, I, th I don't ever want to be disingenuous and lie, but I do think that the, the shagger, yes, I am, was a Jordan <laughs> original. I do think that that was me. Joe Hullett, who created the show, he he left the show a couple of series before we finished, but he was involved then. So he might dispute that, but I'm pretty sure that was my own creation, the, the Shagger, yes, I am. Um, I'm 90% sure it was. Um, <laughs> the, the, the premise is you basically, you get a, a scenario, uh, uh, a story. So me and Sally would get the, the scripts and the, the scripts are basically, you're going to arrest someone in a, in a park who's doing X, Y, Z and they'd be there'd be certain lines like you can say this, but it was all a uh, suggestion as opposed to you have to say that. So you would take that as your maybe template and go, right, that's a good line. I like that. But the nature of improvisation is it's very difficult to say, to, to make it that organic and happen. Like if you've got a line, because it, it goes off piece all the time and, and, you end up going down a blind alley going, well, there's no way I can say that. So it's the vast, vast majority of it is improvised. 
occasionally, you know, during a take, Noddy director or uh, Stuart, who plays Archie Pepper, he's a script super on it. Um, script, sorry, script supervisor, and he's he's brilliant as well. They, they would just throw in a line, say say that. So then you would say that, and that would make the edit. Um, but yeah, it was a real collaborative uh, experience. But yeah, it's mainly improvised. Yeah, it's fantastic. And unbelievably, Jordan, it has been 10 years since you first graced our screens in River City. And throughout those 10 years, Alex has been at the centre of some very intriguing and thought-provoking storylines. From illicit love affairs to arson, to involvement with organised crime, and as we mentioned earlier on, to infant mortality. To what do you attribute Alex's longevity in Shield Inch? And what kinds of storylines would you like to see Alex follow in the future? I, I'm cheap and available. I think that's why my longevity. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I, I don't know. It's always difficult to, you know, if you're asked why if if a certain character's popular or or, or not or what, well, it's it's difficult when you play that character to be objective. I've been incredibly lucky that I have had good stories. I, I think. Being working with Frank because Lenny is the the linchpin of the show. He's the dawn of the show, and I think because I'm part of that family, even though they're a crime family and gangsters, and people get shot every second day, it's still that when you're in with the Murdochs, you you kind of have a, a maybe a wee bit more longevity than than other some other characters. But I think that's that's for other people to de- to decide or discuss um, producers and audience as to why I'm there. I have had a, a huge raft of different kinds of stories, which I, I think I'm incredibly lucky for that, and I've enjoyed that. I've worked with some brilliant actors, great actors, um, Robin Lang, Alex Ferns, Don Steele, you know, the the people I'm working with now, Jenny House, obviously Frank, he's, 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 he's brilliant, um, Claire Dargo, to name but a few, you know, I could go on and on. I what historians would I like to see? I don't know. We know we we get we get no choice in that. We we kind of we, we get meetings because the storyline departments they're well in advance of what we are at, so they're already they're planning for the end of the year. So we don't really get a choice in what we get. We you just kind of go, all right, that's happening, that's happening. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, I'd like to see them. What would I like to see them do? I don't know, actually. I don't know. It's a tough question. I don't know. It's rubbish for a, a podcast and nobody will have an answer, but I don't know. <laughs> and away from work, Jordan, you have very freely given up your time to help charities. Even in 2021, you took part in a skydive in aid of the Beats and Cancer charity. Looking at the video of you on Twitter, you seem to be pretty chilled as you prepare to make the jump. But exactly what emotions are going through your mind as you prepare to propel yourself out of a plane 20,000 feet above ground? Um, that was... Uh, when I was first asked to do it, I I, I nearly said no because I'm, I'm per- petrified of heights. I'm no good with heights at all. So my gut reaction was, ah, I don't think I can do that. You know, Why would anybody scared the heights, jump out of a plane? It seems insane. And then asked the, the, um, uh, the people at the beach if I could have a, a weekend to think about it. And then I kind of had a word with myself and was like, you know what, if if this can in any way help the people that are going through, you know, all kinds of cancer from, you know, terminal cancer to stuff that is curable and the fear that they're going through, it was like, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe it's a bit, it's a bit indulgent for me to say no because I'm scared of heights. So uh, I said yes. Um, it was cancelled five times, which is not uncommon at all for, for skydiving because of the weather. It's so weather dependent. And obviously in Scotland, the weather is so changeable that on the morning you can get through there and then it's cancelled. And that happened to us. But I think there was 20, 22 or something like that jumping. And the whole we all got through there. And, you know, I was shaking the whole time me and my mate James McKenzie we did it and I was petrified but then we got stood down and then on that day they were like oh maybe there's a chance come back in an hour so we went away got some lunch came back an hour and then it was like 
ah, no, you're stood down again. So the emotions were up and down, up and down. And that happened five times. So I'd went through the utter fear of it. And I was kind of over it. And then I got a last minute phone call on a Saturday morning saying, it looks like it's going to be a clear day. Um, do you want to come through? So it was so quick. And I never had any time to think about it. It was kind of like, you need to come through now. And I live at him just outside Glasgow to go through and jump in Fife. So it was, you know, it was another 15 minutes or something. So I had to get through it. And my kids were there and stuff. And my mum was there. And I think, I think it must be some chemical in your brain. I was really quite zen. Nobody believes me everywhere because everyone knows I was how scared I was doing it. I think everyone thinks I'm trying to act cool. It wasn't about acting cool. I just I felt really calm and really zen. And there wasn't a huge amount of fear because I was just an acceptance of, well, this is going to happen. And when we started making our way towards the door, you know, you kind of shuffle towards the open door, there was a bit of a sort of stomach flip there and going, oh, wow, this is really happening. But Pretty much the whole time, I was I was dead calm, which is quite unlike me. But yeah, <laughs> but it was it was pretty pretty amazing. <laughs> it's amazing that how when you're in that position, you just all of a sudden become kind of chilled. Yeah, and it's the same. It's the same way in life. If you're in a difficult situation, it's almost as if you get into this fight or flight mode. Um, yeah, I think that's why. I think I think your it. brain just, you just goes. Do yeah, you do. yeah, you ha- you have to do it. I think. There was no backing out, and I think there was an, just an acceptance going, oh, well, it's, it's happening, I might as well just relax. I even surprised myself when, on the, the flight up. I, I was kind of, my heart wasn't pounding as much as I thought it would, and my stomach wasn't flipping, I wasn't stressing out, I wasn't being, you know, talking panicky or anything. It was, it was weird. It was quite just, yeah, dead chilled. And it was a beautiful view. You could see Ben Nevis, St Andrews, Dundee, Perth, Edinburgh, all of Fife. All at once, and it was it was it was stunning, absolutely stunning. Well, my dad, he's he's jumped out of an aeroplane before. Not he never skydived, but he jumped out of an aeroplane, and he says that that feeling when you're you're up there and you 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 when once the parachute comes out, it's just the best feeling ever. And finally, Jordan, as we mentioned earlier on, you're married to Karen and have two young daughters, Marley and Piper. But do you have a wee dog called Patch? Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't have a wee dog called Patch. No, <laughs> we, we, we don't have a pet. But I think the the uh, the girls are are on it, mate, quite frequently about getting a dog at the minute. So I I, I grew up with dogs, and I, I love dogs. I would have one in a heartbeat. But it's the hours I work and the the nature of my wife's a choreographer, dance teacher. So our hours can be quite erratic, and we. It's difficult to have a dog in those, those circumstances, but it's something that it's 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 probably on the cards. But uh, I won't tell my kids that just yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Jordan Young, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast today, and thank you for being my guest on Clara in Conversation. Well, it's been lovely to chat to you. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Jordan can be seen on River City, which is on the BBC Scotland channel and on BBC One Scotland every Monday to Thursday night. You can always catch up in any episodes that you've missed of River City on BBC iPlayer. You can also be seen this year once again at the Edinburgh Kings Panto at the Festival Theatre. This year's panto is Peter Pan and tickets are already on sale, but you better get them quick as they sell out really fast. You can catch the current series of Scots Squad, indeed all eight series of Scots Squad on BBC iPlayer. And as we mentioned, it is definitely a must see. Also, you can go back and catch up on Legit. You can find all six episodes of Legit on BBC iPlayer. And it is still as fresh and as original as it was back in the day and still makes me laugh heartily. If you want to see more videos like this, click the like and subscribe button and you can click the grey bell to be notified of when I next upload a podcast. Jordan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you once again. Pleasure. Thanks a lot, Claire. Cheers. Cheers.